Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you on this Palm Sunday. Uh, how many of you, when you were younger or in another life in some way, celebrated Palm Sunday with a whole lot of pomp and circumstance? Did you guys do that? So tonight, it's weird, but typically not a whole lot of Baptists do that. But uh, as I'll get to in a second, I don't know why we don't. So maybe it's because we just don't want our kids whacking each other with the uh, palm branches. I heard Clay say that that was when he was younger, that was the, what they, they, they did. Is the kids would get the branches and whack each other. But Well, we are here and we are starting to kick off what is traditionally known throughout the Christian world as Holy Week. Um, Palm Sunday is really that, that first Sunday where we get to really focus our eyes and our attention on it, um, on what is the, the preeminent, the best, the, the greatest holiday in, on the Christian calendar, which is Easter. So and I don't know if you have been following it along with the emails that Barb has been sending out with our, our Lent devotions. Um, I want to thank Michael McCoy for um, asking that we send those out this year. So I, I must confess, I am one of those two where the Lent season and, and Palm Sunday and everything else, it was kind of sort of a back burner when I was growing up. And even as I grew into adulthood, it was, you know, we made a big deal out of Christmas and we made a big deal out of Easter, but the whole season leading up to it was something that was just not a big deal, but it really is a big deal for us as Christians. And so we want to look at that a little bit uh, today. So if you have your Bibles, you can, I want you to turn to John chapter 12. But just a little bit of context as, as to why this is important, why we should all think this is important. The Gospels themselves have 89 total chapters. The first four, well not the first four, but four of those 89 chapters have to do with the first 30 years of Jesus' life. Out of 89, only four chapters for those first 30 years, which includes Christmas. 85 of the 89 chapters have to do with the last three and a half years of the life of Jesus. And 29 chapters have to do with the last week of Jesus's life. So there's a lot of emphasis here on this last week of Jesus, this, this holy week. A lot of the teachings, a lot of the things that we know that Jesus taught, really, we're in this week. So it's a significant time for us. And this this event that we're going to look at today here in John chapter 12, uh, Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, is one of only 12 events that is recorded in all four Gospels. Only, only 12 things. And Christmas, the birth of Jesus, isn't one of them. No, it isn't in all four Gospels. So you have the baptism, feeding of the 5,000, Peter's confession, the anointing of Mary, the triumphal entry, what we're going to look at today, the cleansing of the temple, the Last Supper, Jesus' prayer in the garden, the trials that happened, the crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection. All those things occur in all four of the Gospels. And to me, if all four of the Gospel writers think that this event is important, then we should probably give it a little bit more attention. You know, you think about it, if, if something is on all of the news networks, oh, maybe that's not a good example, because just because it's on the news networks doesn't mean it's that important, right? But, but if it's covered, and everybody's covered, it's something that we usually pay attention to. But it seems too often not that, that I don't know, maybe we don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to approach it. And so that's a little bit what we want to look at today. Um, 
maybe sometimes we identify a little too much with the way that people responded in this Holy Week. Um, but we're going to look at Palm Sunday. We're going to look at that triumphal entry. And, and those of us who have been around the church long enough know that this is the event where Jesus himself comes into Jerusalem. And the crowds are waving, they're cheering, they're laying the palm branches out, announcing him as their king and their savior. And it's a pretty significant event, in part because up until this point, not that Jesus hid who he was, but he didn't really want to make a big deal about it. When there was a miracle that he did, or he interacted with somebody in a very special way, usually he told them, my time hasn't come yet. Don't say anything. You know, don't make a big deal about this. But here on this day, this entry into Jerusalem, Jesus is being intentional in announcing who he was. He was getting the, inten- the attention of the people. So we want to take a look at that um, and see really how we can see ourselves in this story in just a little bit different way. So pray with me before we dive in. Father, we come before you this morning grateful that, that in Christ that we have all that we need. We do, we celebrate, we are, we are so thankful that we can come on this day to worship you, to think back of the events that truly did happen nearly 2,000 years ago and the significance that they have in our life. God, we thank you that your word is powerful and with it, You shape us. You teach us. You expose us in ways that help us to realize that we need you. And you teach us, God, so that we can become like you. And so, Father, I come to you this morning Just pray that you you will direct my words. Father, I recognize that that of all people that I am a broken vessel who needs your truth, who needs your power. And so God, may my words be your words. And help us all to hear what you have to say to us. Help us to not turn away from from words and from your truths that that might convict us from the things that might step on our toes. Yeah, so thank you that we can come and, and to look into your word and celebrate who you are and what you have done. So God, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you're there in John chapter 12, you follow along with me as I read. I'm going to be starting in verse 12 and going all the way through verse 19. It says there, the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. 
At first, his disciples did not understand all this. And only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. And so the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. As I said, this is one of those passages that is found in all four of the Gospels. But before we actually look at the context of what it says, let's look at the broader context and talk about when this actually happened. So this was a short time after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And that was just in the previous chapter, in John chapter 11. Um, But it was really no more than just a few months after that event. And here we see Jesus is coming to the end of his ministry. He had just retreated up to an area called Ephraim uh, because he had, was gaining the, well, let's not say the recognition, but he had gaining the attention of the Jewish leaders even more than he had because of this. And the Jewish leaders were both getting a little jealous uh, because of that attention, a little nervous because of that attention, and what that might do in terms of the response of the Roman Empire toward them and the people. Um, and so they had plotted to kill Jesus at this point. Um, and really, from the time that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and up until this point, like I said, not just more than a few months, Jesus had not yet been back to Jerusalem. He had not gone back into the city. Uh, he had spent time up there near the desert, spent time visiting friends in Bethany and other places, in Jericho, healing But now he's saying, this is the time. This is the time. So it was just a few months after the the resurrection there. But then it was also before Passover. Um, uh, And you might spend a whole lot of time studying this and when were the exact dates of this. And uh, for some people, that's a really big deal. Um, And I really, I spent a lot of time this week just trying to figure out all the exact dates when it was on the Jewish calendar. Um, But we do know this in terms of this. And uh, here before the Passover, if you look back in Exodus uh, chapter 12, and this is when uh, the Israelites were in Egypt. Um, And as you know, the Passover is when uh, the Israelites were freed from captivity and slavery in Egypt. And as they are preparing to do that, God had already done the nine of the ten plagues. Uh, And the last plague is about to happen. And there's preparation rules in terms of this, of what God wanted the people to do. And and Exodus 12 is where that preparation is told. It says, tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, which is the first month of their year, Each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. The animals you choose must be without defect. And then take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. And so we know that this is in the first month of their year. It's leading up to Passover, which is going to happen on the 14th. The day of selection of the lamb is on the 10th. And that is the day that Jesus is coming into Israel, uh, coming into Jerusalem. So it's on the, the 10th of the month, the selection day for the Lamb. Leading up to the Passover festival and the Passover feast. That will just happen just a few days later. But specifically, when did this event happen? If you look earlier on in the chapter, in John chapter 12 and verse 1, it says it was six days before the Passover. That's when Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. 
So he comes into Bethany six days before the Passover. These events happen that next day. So the next day of the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. That's when they took the palm branches out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. So there's significance here happening with these dates. And, um, you know, I don't know, I've spent, like I said, spent a little bit of time looking at this. And you know, traditionally we've done Palm Sunday on Sunday, the triumphal entry on Sunday. Some scholars would say that the actual event, the triumphal entry happened on a Monday. I'm not going to quite tell you where I'm landing because I'm still really trying to figure that out to some degree. I'm leaning, I, I love the traditional, I like Monday. Uh, there are some, John MacArthur thinks that it happened on Monday. Uh, a good acquaintance of mine on staff with Campus Crusade, William Lane Craig, uh, likes the Sunday. A lot of good, most scholars do. And there, there are scriptures that could point it to it. To each of these. And a lot of it really has to do with understanding what certain terms are. If you know when, how uh, the Jewish community looked and talked about days, and the days started in the evening, which, you know, that's why I, I, I like saying that I'm a night person, because, you know, the Jewish calendar, you started in the evening. Jewish day, you started in the evening. And so I figured that's, that must be the way to do it. So that I'm not a morning person. You and I would say the same thing, and God's not a morning person. In Genesis chapter 1, it says there was evening, and then there was morning the first day. So I think God's a night person, but that's just a little side note. But, but anyway, looking at the calendar and, and, and when the day starts, or even um, knowing when the day of preparation was, was that the preparation for the Sabbath, the preparation for the Passover, and those nuances help. Uh, it's the reason why people vary between uh, whether this was Sunday or Monday. But, but we do know for sure that this started six days before the Passover. And then the next day is when Jesus went in uh, into Jerusalem. But who's there? Who are the people that are there at this event? Who are the ones who are saying, Hosanna? Well, because this is Passover, you have hundreds and thousands of people who would be making this pilgrimage from their, the towns and the villages and the cities within Israel, or even Jews from outside of Israel, coming to Jerusalem to celebrate this event. Uh, the historian Jophis, Josephus is that right? yeah. uh, said that there could be up to a million people who would be coming uh, for this event. So there are lots of people coming and being a part of this. But then the crowds that were with them, the crowds that heard us, the crowds who had seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, the crowds who saw what he had done and had come to faith. John 12, verse 9 It says that a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Because of the things that Jesus had done, people came to faith. They came to believe and trust in him. And when they heard that he was coming into Jerusalem, they wanted to be with him. They wanted to see him. They knew that there was something special about this man. I mean, after all, he could raise people from the dead. So they wanted to be with him. And I would say that these people are true believers. These are people who are not just uh, the everyday pilgrim who has come along for the ride. They're not just everybody who is coming in. And certainly there were some who are in this pilgrimage who who weren't followers of Christ. But I, it's pretty clear from the text that those who were there, who were shouting, were people who had seen and have known of Jesus. People who were eager to see Jesus 
set up his kingdom here on earth. And just a little bit of context as well as to where this is happening. And I'm not sure if you could see this on the maps all that well. I should have zoomed in a little bit further. So over here. So you got Jerusalem right here, down here. And Bethany is this little town just to the east of it. So Bethany is a small village on the southeastern slope of the Mount of Olives. It's really about a two and a half mile walk um, from Bethany into Jerusalem. Other uh, gospel accounts of this, and Matthew and Luke also talk about the town of Bethphage uh, that was also on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. So, and that was in between uh, Bethany and Jerusalem. So here they are in this, this small little village on the outskirts of Jerusalem, heading toward the city with hundreds maybe thousands of people making their pilgrimage to Jerusalem, getting ready for the Passover. Let's look a little bit just at, at the events of this. There's one thing that is pretty clear about this. This just was not a typical event in the life of Christ. Um, read from the Gospel of Luke. It says, after this, after Jesus had said this, he went ahead going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. And those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as they went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. This colt, this donkey, uh, plays a pretty prominent role in this story. And this is one of those that, that explains a little bit of the why, a little bit of the purposefulness, the, the significant intentionality of Jesus in this event. See, Jesus had traveled to Jerusalem a number of times to observe the feasts and to do part of his ministry. An entry into Jerusalem has a very unique significance in it. And sometimes we think that this was the last time that Jesus went into Jerusalem, but that's really not true because uh, these gospel stories say that after the event of this and others leading up to the cross, that Jesus actually went back to Bethany and spent the nights there and then came back in throughout the week. But it's the only time where it is mentioned that Jesus rode into the city. Every other time Jesus walked. See, the donkey is a sign of his kingliness, of his kingship. Unlike in our, our way of thinking, you know, we think of a donkey as just some stupid animal, some beast of burden. But a donkey was a royal animal. And so getting this donkey, he was triumphantly arriving as the king. He was coming as a king. But historically, entering on a donkey signified that you were entering in peace, that you are coming as peace, uh, coming in peace. If you came in on a horse, you're coming in as an embattled, a conquering king. But Jesus was coming in peacefully. And so he's announcing his kingship 
Well, at the same time, as some of the writers say in reference to this, Jesus is pointing to the prophecy that, uh, that was alluded to in this. When the prophet Zechariah says that he comes meek and lowly, which there is Zechariah 9.9, 9, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. See, when the prophet Zechariah says that he comes meek and lowly, it means that the king is coming in peace. With no army, no military procession, he comes humbly, peacefully. And Jesus knows of this prophecy and he applies it to himself. And then he takes action to acquire the donkey by sending his two disciples uh, to go ahead and get it. This wasn't just something that he stumbled upon. Uh, it wasn't just something that he was saying, oh, I'm tired, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to ride in today. This wasn't just one of those events where eh, it kind of fit perfectly and then sort of the, the gospel writers are retrofitting this. That's not how that works. Jesus knew of this prophecy and he's like... This applies to me. And this event also shows the lordship of Christ. And that, that he knew the events. He knew that the donkey was there. He knew what was going to be asked. He knew what the people should say in response. And it happened just the way that he said it would. So it was common in the enthronement ceremonies of the kings of Israel uh, to come into the city on a donkey. It was common uh, for the leaders of the nations around them uh, to, be co to come in and, and show what type of leader would they would be. I'm pretty sure the, the Israelites knew specifically of how Pompeii came into the city um, about a century prior to this, coming in as a conqueror of the Jews. But Jesus came in and showed that he was different, that he was coming in peacefully, that he was coming in as a king. He was coming in as prophesied, but humbly and meekly. This was a deliberate and purposeful, intentional act by Jesus to show who he was and to make himself known to the people. Continuing on uh, with this, so not only is there the donkey a part of this story, but it's what, what the people were saying. They were saying, Hosanna, save us. According to Strong's Bible Dictionary, Hosanna means save us, to liberate us. It's also a cry of blessing. Bless us. And the word is used about 200 times in the Old Testament. So this isn't really the first time uh, that the Jewish people would say this. is, is And uh, what they are shouting here is quoting from Psalm 118. That's the verse that's up on the screen now. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. A good Jewish family would know of this verse. They would know this psalm. And this was actually one of those psalms that they would sing and chant and recite uh, as they participated in the Feast of Tabernacles that would happen you know, a few months after Passover. So it's not something that would have been uncommon for a Jewish person to say 
uh, as they were going up to Jerusalem. But here is where they're specifically saying it in reference to Jesus, their king. Certainly they would say this because they were hoping that Jesus would come and save them from their enemies. They wanted Jesus to rescue them from the oppression that they had under Roman leadership. But they would also say that as a way of remembering the way that God had rescued them in the past. You know, see, the, the book of Psalms, where this, like I said, where this is coming from, is where this word Hosanna, save us, save me now. The word is used most often there in Psalms, probably because David, who's the writer of most of the Psalms, often found himself in trouble, being chased by uh, King Saul. As King Saul was chasing him, I'm sure David was saying, God, save me now. And again, once David became king, and others from within his kingdom and around around him were trying to bring him down and bring the nation down, David would shout out to God and write to God and sing to God, save me. And this is what the people were doing as Jesus was coming in. This is our king. Save us. And we'll go into a minute, uh, in a minute or so here, we'll say whether or not they fully comprehended what they were saying and if they, what they, fully, if they fully comprehended what they were seeing. But there were those, as we said in the crowd, who are true believers. And there were those who saw this, understood this, and applied this to Jesus as well. And the palm branches, why we call it Palm Sunday. Well, we're all familiar with this concept of rolling out the red carpet. Have you ever been in a situation where you've had the red carpet rolled out for you? I can't say that I have. The closest thing I ever had to, to being a part of that was a few years ago, my daughter and I were in Albania on uh, a mission trip. And... Uh, we were kind of walking down the main street in town and we stumbled upon this big red carpet event. Um, and frankly, I don't even know what it was because it was in Albania. And I, but it seemed like there were a lot, I mean, there were a lot of gorgeous people there. <laughs> Guys dressed to the nines, ladies in, in fancy dresses and you know, we stumbled upon all these people coming in limousines and everything else. And then everybody all went inside and all the cameras went away. And we got to walk on the red carpet. And we got to be pretty cool. Like, yeah, that's yeah, kind of fun. Nobody took pictures of us. But... but that's what the palm branches were. This was the, th the red carpet of the day. At the same time, people were throwing their cloaks down. And this was throwing the cloaks and their branches down was this gesture of honor. The palm branches were used to celebrate victory. It's kind of interesting to me that, that in some of these gospel um, stories about this, that they focus a little bit more on, on the cloaks. I don't know why we don't call this Cloak Sunday. I mean, it's just not as fun to go around waving your jacket or something, but um, but these events, the, the, the waving of the branches, the throwing them down at the feet, the, the covering up of the road, taking off their identity and their jackets and putting it down at the feet of the one who is coming showed the sign of humility and submi submission to the king. And in many ways, that's what the people were doing here. They were taking off their cloaks, taking off their identity, putting it down at the feet of Jesus. They were waving their branches in victory and celebration, putting it down to pave his way uh, toward Jerusalem. 
And again, putting down the cloaks is not, you know, this wasn't the first time that that happened. Um, 2 Kings 9, 13 uh, talks of when Jehu became king of Israel and they put down the cloaks for him as he went through in his kingly procession. So this is the event. This is Jesus coming back into Jerusalem for the first time, knowing that the religious leaders wanted to kill him. He was going to celebrate the Passover. He was going in on the day of selecting the lamb. And all these events are happening. And we look back 2,000 years and we say, oh, we, we recognize that. This was Jesus coming in as the king. This was Jesus announcing himself, who he was. He was making a big deal about it. People were making a big deal about it. And we look back and say, yeah, if I was there, I would have done the same thing. I would celebrate that. You know, I, I can get in on, on waving around some palm branches and cheering. And this is a memorable time in the life and the ministry of Christ. Because he's saying who he is. And he's announcing what he's about to do. And I, as I said before, I do believe that those who are there were true believers in Jesus. That they were the ones who saw what he did they heard about him. They came and they were the ones who did this. This was a true, genuine sign of worship. But then you can jump ahead to the story just a few days. And you hear that there are crowds yelling, crucify him. And you think, what happened? How can you go from crowds saying, save us, you're our king, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, to those who say, crucify him, just in the span of just a few short days. I would venture to say that most of the people who were yelling crucify him weren't the same ones as this. If you look at the timelines, of even when the trials and all that stuff was, that, that, you know, it's not likely that it was all the same people, although I'm sure that there were some. But how do you go from Hosanna to crucify? That's what I want to spend just the remainder of my time talking about that. So how is it that some people went from shouting Hosanna Save us now one day, and then just a few short days later, yelling crucify us. So I'm going to give you four, four reasons. And, it, and I want to give these because I think that many times we are this way ourselves. That we could worship Jesus on Sunday. And then on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, it could be like... Eh, back burner or I'm not even sure what I think about him anymore the first one is that people could have been caught up with the crowd peer pressure you know maybe there were some there who were only there because it seemed like it was the thing to do at the time hey I'm going up to Jerusalem and oh yeah geez I heard about that and hey everybody else is cheering so I'm going to cheer along too you know, a couple weeks ago, uh, Bill Shaw invited me to go to the NCAA first four games over at, uh, at UD. That was a really good time. I love going to those games. Um, but neither he or I or the people that we went with, we, hadn't, we didn't have any skin in those games. Well, there weren't teams that we were rooting for. What, teams out of Wyoming or two teams out of Texas that we watched. Indiana, you know, Indiana was the closest thing we had to somebody that 
that I would have been rooting for, but I didn't like the Indiana fan, so I rooted for the other team. But anyway, um, I didn't have a team on the court, but I still cheered for a team. Like, I was there. That was the event I was doing. I was in it, and I was cheering. I was genuinely rooting for Wyoming to beat Indiana. They didn't, but anyway. So they're caught up with the crowd. That's just going whichever way the wind blows. You know, maybe they, the people there stumbled upon this event like some of us might stumble upon a parade. You know, driving around, you see a crowd of people. Oh, what's all this happening? Well, that looks like fun. And you hop into the crowd, and you see, you know, whatever, stand by, you cheer, you clap, whatever. So you join in and cheer along. But then a few days later, something else comes along. And here the people were stirred up by the religious leaders to go against Jesus. But if you're just there and part of it being caught up with the crowd, it's not because that's what you care about. It's just, just what you do at the time. And certainly, as I said, the, the Pharisees were intentional about stirring up the crowd, either by force or by bribery, to root against Jesus. You know, they caused a lot of fear in people, knowing what they had the power to do. But if you're just caught up with the crowd, really what you care about is your own personal interest. Is it good for me? Is it fun for me? You know, maybe they were just doing the religious thing, heading up to Jerusalem for the Passover because a friend or a family member wanted them to do it. But it isn't really what they believed. We can be that way at times. You know, Christmas and Easter are those times when our churches are full because those are the times of year that People go and celebrate. They know that those are important events in the life of a Christian. So they come out and celebrate on those days. Uh, but the crowd, family, other things pull them away and they're not part of it the rest of the year. So maybe those who were there, they, they were just caught up in the moment. And then a few days later, they were caught up in that moment. And they just went with the crowd then. Or maybe they just had a really bad short-term memory. You know, John 10, 41 and 42, and 10, 11, 45, and 12, 11. You know, those are, those are all passages that saying that people came to faith after seeing the many signs and miracles that Jesus did. And certainly throughout the gospel stories of, of Jesus' miracles, you see that people saw what he did and they believed in him. People saw and recognized that he was a person sent from God. They were amazed and astonished by his words. They heard his claims. Actually, seven times even this week, this last week of Jesus' life, he demonstrated his lordship to his disciples by predicting what would happen. This issue with the cult. He told them what to expect in preparation for the Passover. Jesus predicted Jesus, uh, Judas' betrayal. He predicted Peter's denial. He predicted that the disciples would desert him, that he'd be tried by Gentiles that he would be scourged and executed. And yet his own disciples fled and hid, forgetting everything else that Jesus had said about himself and what he would do. The crowd saw his miracles and, and knew that the power of God was on him. 
And yet, they seem to have forgotten the words and the promises of Jesus just a few days later. So maybe that's how they went from going from save us to crucify him. Or maybe, and I think this is probably a really big one, it was their unmet expectations. Remember how the Jews were looking forward to the Messiah? Well, what did they expect? They were looking for a political and military leader. They expected that their Messiah, that their Savior, would be the one who would save them from the oppression of the Roman rulers, the Roman occupiers. They expected that Jesus would physically reestablish the throne of David by force, if necessary. And I'm sure that some, when they saw Jesus riding in on a colt and not a horse, were like, ah, that's not how you're supposed to do it. You're not going to get the attention of the Romans by going in on a colt. Where's your war horse, Jesus? But then, you know, like, all right, we'll let that slide. But then, the next day, he goes into the temple, and rather than going into Jerusalem and overthrowing the Romans, he goes into the temple, and he disrupts the Jews. And I'm sure that angered some people. Like, what are you doing disrupting our religious thing and disrupting our economy you should be over there dealing with the romans this is not what we expect you to do jesus i'm sure he's wondering why he was going after their own people his own people rather than the romans who were 10 or 100 times worse Jesus didn't meet their expectations. And so maybe there were some who, like, yeah, that's, and that's enough for me. I think underlying all of these, it's possibly that there was just some real biblical ignorance going on. Sure, the people were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for somebody who would save them. They knew that the scriptures had something to say about the Messiah. They were looking for a Davidic king. They were looking for a prophet who was like Moses. They were looking for somebody who would serve in a priestly capacity. Somebody who could do miracles and show that he had God's blessing on him. Somebody who could act authoritatively, not being the son of man. They knew those things, and, and sure, maybe they saw those things in Jesus. It was pretty obvious if they were looking. But they missed so many things that were right in front of their eyes. I'm sure most of them missed the significance of the donkey. How many times did Jesus say what would happen? That that this temple would be destroyed and yet in three days he would rebuild it again. He wasn't talking about the physical temple. He was talking about his own body. There were things about what was said of Jesus in the Old Testament that people missed. They expected one thing. They had a They had a bit of an understanding of scriptures there, but they didn't have the entirety of their understanding. So just looking at these four things, often we are like that crowd. We may not go all the way to the dark side and say, crucify him. But there are times that that Jesus doesn't 
match up with what we expect. It's like I said, we might put them on the back burner or we might be tempted to chuck it all and walk away from the faith. Now, sometimes, caught up with the crowd, sometimes our faith isn't our own. Sometimes we are here in this room, we come to church because mom or dad want us to. Uh, Because I don't want to disappoint one of the pastors, or I don't want to disappoint my grandma who who really wants me to be in church. You know, we might be one of those C&E, Christmas and Easter type people. Or maybe we've forgotten what God has done in our life. Maybe we've forgotten what Jesus saved us from. Our lifestyles that he saved us from. A lifestyle that we were heading toward that by his grace we're not heading toward anymore. And he saved us from our reckless lifestyle. Or maybe we forget that God has been, how God has been good to us. How he's blessed us, how he's given us a family. How he's provided for us. How he's given us his word. How he cares for us. But sometimes, you know, that, that was just, that was long ago. I'm not seeing his goodness now. Or it's too hard now. So, we put Christ on the back burner. Or in a place where God doesn't meet your expectations, you know, maybe God hasn't provided that significant other yet that you've been hoping and praying for. Or maybe you're in a marriage that is hard and it hasn't worked out the way that you hoped. And yet you think, you know, God was supposed to protect me from that. Or maybe he hasn't provided kids for your family yet. Or you didn't get the promotion you were praying for. Or maybe tragedy has hit your family multiple times. And you're like, God, that's not fair. So there's a temptation to chuck your faith. Maybe you started thinking that maybe God just really doesn't love me. God hasn't done his part in this. Do you know what? Jesus is Lord of all. And he's not obligated to live up to our expectations. God isn't required to accept your lifestyle that goes against his design. We must align our expectations with what God desires for us. Or maybe we said at the root of it is biblical ignorance. You know, it's been said that the best way to be prepared for a test is to have studied beforehand. I didn't quite learn that in college the way that I should have. I was one of those who was often cramming right up into walking into the door, but and literally walking into the door because I was cramming as I'm walking into the room. But, but too often, we haven't even cracked open the book. We will go through life thinking that by sitting in church for an hour a week or maybe a, an hour every day in chapel or, or some other thing, that that's enough to know what God's word has to say and how we should live our lives. But we don't know God's word the way that we should. And oftentimes, and I'm speaking to myself as much as anybody else, that We don't put it into action the way that God calls us to. Like the kids are learning in Blast, the story of the the wise and the foolish man. Like the wise man is one who hears his words and puts it into action. Some of us assume that we know and fully understand what the Bible says. Yet we we fail to apply it to our lives. 
And others of us haven't a clue about what the Bible says because we've never taken the time to read it. You know, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him he will make your path straight. How can we trust him if we don't even know him? How can we know him if we don't ever crack open his book to us? Those are ways that that we are tempted to go from Hosanna, to go from worshiping this God of ours, to in our hearts saying, crucify him. And so my prayer for all of us on on this Palm Sunday, on this triumphal entry day, is that we would be people who would recognize Jesus for who he is. And that we would fully dedicate our hearts and our lives to him because he is our king. He is our king of peace. And he deserves that red carpet in our lives if only we would lay it out for him. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and we're going to sing one last song. And as we do... I just pray that we would reflect on, on not just the ceremony of this day, you know, that it, that it just being part of the church calendar, but reflect on really the reality of who Jesus is and have we fully given ourselves to him.